look for truth. Why do I exist? What am I here for? What is this all about? What's it all about, Alfie? You know, looking, trying to figure out what's my place in life and why do I? I'm I'm here. You know, why am I here? And so, uh, you know, that that thank thank you, Jesus, it led me to Christ. Because I did look in other areas. I wasn't, you know, just like, well, whatever, you know, I'll I'll pick up and believe what I've been taught. Because honestly, and I don't say this with disrespect, I'd throw this, if I found that this was not true, I'd throw this away as fast as I could. Yeah. Because I want truth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I've never found anything Amen. that even comes remotely close Amen. to this and lines up with not only creation, but my own personal life Amen. and world and existence. And so, you know, when I first gave my life to Christ, um, by the grace of God, I began to listen after ministers and preachers, aside from <coughs> what I was getting because I was raised in a particular denomination uh, and I stayed in that denomination for five years. Uh, Kind of just, you know, uh, learning, growing. Uh, Not because of the denomination, I'll say this, in spite of the denomination. Mm -hmm. Because the reason I learned and I I grew was because I picked up this book from from the genesis of my salvation. I picked up this book Actually, somebody shoved one in my hand. <laughs> and, and, and I began to read it. And, and the truth began to set me free, right? What is it, what, what is it that Jesus says in John 8, 31 and yes, 32? Yes, if you remain in my word, mm-hmm. so you can't just quote 8, 32. Mm-mm. If you remain in my word, then I use my disciples indeed. If you don't remain in the word, right. you can't be a disciple of Christ. Amen. Amen. If you remain in my word, then I use my disciples indeed. Then you will know the truth, and then the truth will set you free. Amen. Amen. Right? So the truth will set you free is true, but if you don't know what the truth is, and the only way you're going to find truth is by the Word of God. And so I started that process, and and of course, the longer I stayed in that denomination, the less I could stay there. I felt more and more uncomfortable because all I got was rituals and sacraments, Mm -hmm. but I had very little truth. As a matter of fact, I discovered that the truth of God's word actually contradicted my <laughs> denomination. Yeah. So it's time to, you know, pack my bags and move on. But in that process, I managed to connect with uh, a number of different ministers, and several of the ministers that really helped me, uh, one was Brother Kenneth Colton, who is still alive. <laughs> Another one is Fred Price, mm-hmm. who is still alive. Yeah. Another one is Brother Hagen Sr., who is no longer with us. Um, he is in glory, Amen. but he's part of the great church that is both in heaven and on earth. Amen. And uh, But I learned from these men truths out of the scriptures that began to set me free, that began mm-hmm. to line up with creation, life, God. And the more I adhere to them, the freer I got. And uh, I, I just, I'm, I'm saying all of this to say, to come to this place. That was four decades ago. I still listen to some of those men. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go see, uh, God willing, Brother Colton mm-hmm. uh, in June because there's a, a, I have a brother friend, pastor that is in New Hampshire, has been there for 30 years, and Brother Colton's going to his place to celebrate mm-hmm. that 30 year nice. revival. Wow. So I have the privilege of being there for that. And, um, What I'm saying is is that the truths that they taught me that I verified out of the Word of God. I didn't just say, okay, well, that's good, thanks, I got that. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever you say, I'll believe. I went to the Word. Mm -hmm. I've not been that excited. I used to carry around my little cassette recorder with a little T-bar, you know, like push forward, it would play, push this way, it would go fast forward, push that way, it would go reverse. I used to carry it, I'd carry it up to my car. Mm -hmm. I'd I'd take a bath, because we didn't have a shower back then. (laughs) And I'd put it on the top of the back of the toilet and listen to it. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And my wife, at first, couldn't stand listening to Brother Copeland's drawl. 
And, uh, but she eventually got saved and changed her ways. And uh, it, was a, it was a work, and getting her set free has been a job that I have worked at for many years now. But we're almost, we're getting her there, thanks to Jesus. But I, I'm, I'm laying the groundwork for something, and that is that you've heard me speak of Dr. Caroline Leaf. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I've not been as excited about, a, she doesn't call herself a preacher, she calls herself a doctor mm -hmm. of multiple things. She's a, uh, uh, no. I, I can't even give you what her, her background is. You have to go out and read it yourself. Um, but this is the third book I've read by her. In this book, she is a she is a hardcore believer. Why don't you know that? This woman is a hardcore believer. And this book, I think, is probably the best of the three that I've read so far. It's called The Perfect You. And the real concept simply is this. If you can be free and set free to really be who God meant you to be, you will be incredible in this world. Incredible. And you will actually reflect the glory of God, not only back to, get to the Father, right? Because we've, we've been, you know, a chosen generation, royal priesthood, holy nation, his own special people. Why? That we may proclaim the praises right. of him That's who called right. us out of darkness, right? Into his marvelous light. Into his marvelous light, yes, sir. Uh, this woman, this woman of God, scientist and preacher, writes things that in some cases I've known and principles I've seen out of the word of God and I've preached, but I hear very few people preach them. She puts them in words that articulate what actually is happening, not only in the spirit, but in the natural. And I just want to read something real, real brief to you. It's a little bit of a read, but just, you know, bear with me. Um, Mary, I think you moved my bookmark. Oh, Mary. oh no. <laughs> Mary had the book earlier. I said, don't move the bookmark, Mary. She said, I won't move the bookmark. <laughs> now, uh, uh, if you don't get what she's saying, stay with it. Go back and read it again. It may not initially, it may not strike a chord with you. Go back and do it again. Read it again. Because this is, again, you won't hear me say this. I don't pick up books and read them more than once. I will read her books easily more than once. And I will highlight and I will take notes. Because the truth that she expounds is amazing. I want to just show you here the link between what she says and, and how she links it to God. It says, indeed, we are wired to be addicted to and consumed by God. Then she quotes Psalm 42, 63, 73, 119, Isaiah 26, John 4, and so on and so forth. Revelation 21. just want you to show. She's, she, all the way through this thing, she goes to God. Her first book was kind of a little bit like this. Second book was almost entirely secular, which is Think, Learn, Succeed. This third book, she is like, the heck with everything else. This is what God says. This is who God made you to be. God created us for a relationship with him. Nothing else will satisfy this need to pray continuously Amen. and set up a constant, Amen. eternal, internal dialogue with the Holy Spirit so that we stay addicted to him, offering up our minds and bodies as a living sacrifice every day. She, and she refers to Romans 12, 2. Despite the allure of powerful chemicals released by our bodies, we must never forget that he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And she was talking about the, the struggles that your body produces prior to this. God has given us the ability to break free from any toxic pattern. And this happens when we are in the perfect you, which is the title of the book. We have all experienced the power of stepping out of our perfect you, hence out of love and smack bang into fear. It affects us deeply, and we handle it in several ways based on choices we have made and will make. We can control the fear through conscious cognitive 
evaluation, really believing that God has not given us a spirit of fear, 2 Timothy, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Or we can become dominated by the unconscious, toxic thoughts that have actualized into habits over time, which throw the brain and the body into toxic stress. Instead of controlling fear, we make it worse and increase the toxic stress response in our brains and bodies. And what she talks about on a continual basis is the stress, toxic stress levels in our body that stem from our mind that affects our DNA and literally causes diseases to arise up in our bodies. And she said that scientists are more and more and more believing that 75 to 90% of the diseases that we suffer in our bodies, cancers, Alzheimer's, blood disorders, diabetes, you name it, are a result of toxicity in our thought life that translates into our body that gets down to the cell and molecular level. Mm -hmm. Our DNA literally changes, literally changes because of the instantaneous power of our thoughts. <clears throat> Glory to God. Bear with me just a little bit, please. Mm -hmm. The latter situation Concentrating and ruminating on the fear. Ruminating just means to think over and over and over again. Can bring about a fearful state even in the absence of an actual fear stimulus. So in other words, nothing's happening to us other than in the mind. For example, this is typically what happens to most post-traumatic stress disorder individuals. Where the memory of a trauma can invoke a response in people that is as real as when it happened. Even if the trauma occurred decades ago. The attitudes, and she hyphenates it and says, the attitudes, clusters of thoughts with emotions attached. Mm -hmm. Clusters of yeah. thoughts with the emotions attached produce chemicals for anxiety and worry, even though the person is no longer th in threatening circumstances. Mm -hmm. So I'm not there, I'm not going through it, but it results in that same stress and overload on my body. Listen to this, every thought changes the brain chemistry. Every thought changes the brain chemistry, which impacts 75 to 100 trillion cells of the body at quantum speeds. The impact is instantaneous, literally beyond space and time. Hence, an experience of toxic stress can, pro can progress into mental ill health if it is constantly ruminated on and not dealt with. Remember, whenever, yep. whatever we think about the most will grow. Literally will grow. And this is something she talks about continuously as well. Your thoughts are not just thin air, but rather they produce physical real estate in your brain. A thought that is thought over and over and over again begins to grow in a portion of your brain and it sets up camp there, which is why you can recall it, and it, and it happens over and over again. I like to use this, and I've used this kind of an example in a situation where people talk about how do I forgive, and I've dealt with this with people and not being able to forgive. I said, let's just use a terrible example of a young girl who maybe has been raped over and over again by her uncle, whatever. And maybe some of you have gone through that, so if this is stressing you, I apologize, but understand this because lack of forgiveness keeps that thing bound to us. Mm. But that you've worked to forgive and you've worked to forgive. Sometimes we can, um, of the will, and which is where forgiveness starts, we of the will begin to forgive people, but there's still healing that needs to occur <clears throat> in here. Because many times what happens is, is we don't remember the occurrence so much as we remember the feeling and the experiences. And so you've worked to forgive, you've forgotten about it, you've dealt with it, and then years later, you go to a gathering, and that uncle is there. And out of the blue, out of nowhere, comes all of the stress, all of the fear, all of the anger, all of the bitterness, all of the things that we thought we dealt with, it's still there, because it hasn't been completely dealt with, and that stuff stays inside of you, and it's toxic to your life. It is literally destructive. Mental ill health is not just a disease. 
It is trauma and it, and it is trauma and habituated incorrect through reactions that have not been dealt with where we have stepped out of the perfect you in response to the events and circumstances of our lives. Just a little bit more. This creates neurological chaos that can manifest as disorders of the mind with concomitant symptoms, which just means incidental symptoms, concomitant sim symptoms erroneously termed biological diseases. Thoughts about a toxic occurrence, not necessarily the actual toxic occurrence, can set off a negative stress response. Thoughts are real things made of proteins that occupy mental real estate. If we worry every day about what might happen or what has happened, we repeatedly recreate the signal that stimulates genetic expression to build and strengthen that thought into a long-term memory, which leads to a feeling of uneasiness, resulting in a toxic stress response, unless we choose to control our thinking. Mm. Amen. You know, I just did, Mary, I, I put bookmark in the wrong place and didn't put it back, and I forgot where I am. <laughs> I, I, I want to encourage you to get the book, listen to her podcast, she has incredible podcasts. I've listened to about a half a dozen of them, dealing with that, dealing with a number of different things. It's almost like having a psychoanalyst in your car with you as you're driving down the road. But I can tell you, she doesn't just talk about the things. She tells you in some cases, uh, for instance, why do we repeat some of the things over and over again in our lives that we do? Things that we don't even like ourselves. Ruminating. Yep. We ruminate on it, but we repeat things. We, repeat, we have bad habits, we yeah, call yeah, them. Yeah. Why do we do that? Why is that happening in our brain? And how do we fix that? I, I, I'm saying all of that because of this. This woman, this, I, I don't mean to be derogatory, so I, I hope, don't, hope that doesn't sound bad. This person. I, I've never been as excited about listening to a preacher, as I said, in the last 40 years. Because she preaches Amen. truth and yeah. things that are directly in line with the Word of God. And that I see, and she vocalizes them, and she puts science behind them. But then she goes down under the covers right. and tells you exactly what happens. For instance, never in my life have I been more confident in Romans 12, 2. <clears throat> be not conformed to this world. but Because she talks about the D your DNA can change as a result of your constant thinking. Yeah, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. That my body's DNA, my my the, the 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 structure of my cells begins to change as a result of my constantly ruminating, good or bad. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. But think about Romans twelve two in that context. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Not just transformed in the way I act or speak, but transformed. Completely, yeah. my body transforms, Amen. Amen. and I can just say this to you: if you don't take anything else, hear this last pop. I have been more at peace. I have more of the shalom of God mm -hmm. in my life mm -hmm. as a result of things that she has said and taught me in a very short period of time than I have had. In, in other words, I was got as far as I could go after reading and studying and hearing some of the things that she said and putting them in context of the scriptures, there's more peace in my life and more of the shalom of God and more of the freedom of God in my life than I think I've ever had. Praise God. Period. That's what I think about this. Her, this woman, her teaching, this professor, this doctor, who is also a preacher of righteousness. Amen. Amen. Uh, avail yourself of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now I've got to show up my message. I didn't intend to go that long, but I, I, the reason I say it is because, you know what, I want to give you stuff. Right. I like to have you out, walk out Amen. the door and say, you know what, I got Amen. something in my back pocket. Right. You know what, right. I can pull this out and I can use it. <clears throat> That's what I like to do when you come in here. Yes. I don't want to give you some cute little message that makes you like, oh, that was funny. I want to give you something that changes your life. Amen. And that's why I took the time to do that. Thanks. I want to be about my father's business. Yes. Amen. Jesus knew why he was here on the earth. This is the message. We're beginning the message now. <laughs> you know what? I'm sorry. 
Aaron? Uh, it started a long time ago. Oh, it started a long time ago. Oh. <laughs> Hi, everybody. That's all right, bro. That's all right. That's all right. You did fine. You did fine. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, I said a lot of things I didn't want everybody to know. No, no. Especially about Ian. Probably get some feedback. Worry about I want to be about my father's business. Jesus knew why he was on the earth. John, in John chapter 4, he's with the woman at the well. And he's there and he teaches and he ministers to her. And he prophetically, with a word of, with a word of knowledge, he begins to unfold her life. And the apostles come upon them, right? Come upon the two of them. And he's like, why is, she, why is he talking with her? And so on and so forth. And they're, and they're like, you know, Master, you need to eat. And Jesus responds, which is one of the most beautiful responses. I love it in the King James Version. I have meat to eat that you know not of. Amen. I have food that you don't even know what, what it is. He said, my food, John 4, 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. That was his food. Why? Because he knew why he was on the earth. He knew what his purpose was. And once it was accomplished, he was ready to leave. The cross, he was not looking and saying, I'm leaving something behind. He was going forward. When we leave this earth, we need to know what we're going forward to right. and have That's confidence right. that death is anything but the end. Amen. It's the beginning of glory. Yes. Hallelujah. But Jesus knew why he was on the earth, and when he was on the earth, he wanted to finish what it was that he was doing. We see him back in the book of Luke in chapter 2, where we know that his parents go to Jerusalem to pay tax and to be counted in the, uh, the, the um, census. And of course, they leave, and they don't really, they just think he's going to be with the group, and they leave. And of course, they find out several days later that he's not there. And so they go back to Jerusalem. And in verse 46 of chapter 2, it says, Now, so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. Mm -hmm. And all who heard him were astonished. At his understanding and answers. Think about this. At 12 years old, he was astonishing teachers of the law. I mean, they were astonished. They were like, what? Who is this kid? Where did he come from? Right? They were astonished. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, why, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? In his head, he was as confused as they were that they were lost, they had lost him. So where'd you think I would be? At 12, where'd you think I would be? And he wasn't trying to be sarcastic. He wasn't trying to be belligerent. He said, I'm going to be in the house of God. And I'm going to be doing his work. Why? He's doing his father's business. Now, what was his father's business? It was, in essence, to spread what we call the Great Commission. And he gave the Great Commission to the body of Christ. In Mark 16, we see where he says to us in verse 15, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, and he who does not believe will be condemned. Our goal is to go and preach. Just to go and preach. Here Jesus gives the Great Commission, not just to the apostles, he gives it to the church. Listen, if he gave it to the apostles, where would we be? Yeah, if he just gave it to the apostles, where would we be? That's right. Because you know what? There was somebody that took this gospel and shared it with me. There was somebody that told me about the gospel. Mm. Norm, you went down to tell my niece about the gospel. No. No, you went. went down to tell her about something else. She told you about the gospel. Yeah, amen. Right? right? There was right. somebody that gave the gospel to you in one form or another. Yeah. And, and I want to say this too. Don't think, again, that I'm not part of what it is that God has called the body of Christ to do. Every single one of us has this part to play. I don't care how you play it, but you've got to play it your way, but you've got to play it. Amen. In, in uh, Acts 7, we see where, you know, uh, Stephen is persecuted and, and condemned and stoned. And he gives this incredible message, really, under the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit. But in verse chapter 8, we see, it says, We're now Saul, who was consenting to the death of Stephen. At, the time, uh, at that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. 
And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. So look at this. Everybody in the church or most of the church was scattered at that point. The apostles stayed in Jerusalem. It says, And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women to prison, uh, men and women committing them to prison. Verse 4, chapter 8. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere mm -hmm. preaching the word. They were not apostles that were scattered. They were church members that were scattered. Mm -hmm. They went everywhere preaching the word. The Great Commission has been given to the church, not to the apostles. Mm -hmm. We are commissioned to go into all the world and preach Amen. the, cost, the right. gospel. We are called by God himself. Yes. You have a calling on your life to preach the gospel. Yes. Maybe not yes. from a pulpit, but certainly from your position, wherever you are, whatever workplace you are in, right. whatever environment you walk into, you are called to preach the gospel. Amen. You may not do it every day. You may not do it all the time. But if you don't do it any other way, do it by your lifestyle, Amen. Amen. That's right. yes. if nothing else. Amen. In Luke, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul writes, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Now Paul was not talking about himself and Timothy. He's talking about the body of Christ. Yeah. He saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. This was not just for Paul and Timothy. This is for the body of Christ. We are called. 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 Amen. Listen to me. The same anointing that is upon the head is upon the body. Amen. I, if, if somebody walks in the door... If Ralph walks in the door, I don't say to Ralph, or I don't say about Ralph, oh, look, here comes Ralph's head. <laughs> I say, here comes Ralph, right? And when I say Ralph, I'm not talking about his head only. I'm not talking about his body only. I'm talking about every bit of who Ralph is walk through that door because they're all one. We are all one body in Christ, and what you do affects one another. So remember that. You hear me? Yes. Remember that. What you do affects one another. Mm -hmm. But listen to me. The, the anointing was upon the head, and the anointing drips downward. Come on. The anointing, you go look at the anointing in Psalm 133. It talks about that unity in the body. It's like the anointing oil that was upon the beard, the beard of Aaron that dripped down upon his clothes. That anointing drips down. What did Jesus say happened to him when he went into Jerusalem after he returned from the desert? In Luke chapter 4, mm -hmm. he says, the Spirit, right? He came and he stood up as it was his turn to read. He stood up and he found the place in Isaiah where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That anointing that was upon him is upon you. You can't get away from it. And you're responsible for it. So you might as well know about it, and you might as well embrace it, and you might as well declare yourself going to walk in it. And then if you do that, I'm telling you, what you receive and what you walk in, God will bless and anoint. Amen. What you receive, when you receive that and you walk in it, God will bless it. And when you do, you're going to find yourself in situations that you didn't think you were going to be in, and you will bring, all of a sudden, you will be bringing forth the Word of God. You'll be at some silly birthday party or some baby shower or something and somebody's going to come up to you and they're going to say a couple things and you're going to say a couple things and then they'll say a couple things and then you'll say a couple things and the next thing you know you'll be ministering grace and truth That's and right. life That's and salvation right. and freedom and, and holiness 
and redemption to someone who is bound and confused and has no idea where they are or what they're here for or why they exist. Yeah. And at the same time of solving, working to solve their problem, you're going to be bringing salvation to them. Amen. And you're going to be declaring yes. the acceptable here of the Lord. Yes. You're going to be setting the captive yes. free. Amen. Because the anointing that is upon the head is upon the body. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Do never minimize yourself or your position in the body of Christ. Amen. Never. Amen. That's good, Pastor. Never minimize yourself. Because God called you. Amen. God, my calling is from God. Amen. The world didn't call me. The world didn't tell me who to be. God told me who I am. And God told me who I am to be. And God has given me my assignment. And God has given you your assignment. Listen to this out of Hebrews chapter 3. Verse 1. Therefore, I want you to see this. If you don't have your Bible, get it and open it up. Open up your electronic device. Look it up. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Partakers of the heavenly calling. Consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him, who appointed him as Moses, also was faithful in all his house. If there's one thing I want in my life, it's faithfulness. Amen. I pray for that so hard because I've been unfaithful. Amen. Mm -hmm. I'm just telling you like it is. I've been unfaithful to God, to my family. I've been unfaithful. I've done things I shouldn't have done. I've said things I shouldn't have said. I've thought things I shouldn't have done. I want to stand before God and hear Amen. His words. Amen. Amen. I'm desperate. Thank you, Jesus. I'm desperate. Thank you, God. I want to hear well done, thou faithful, good and faithful. I don't care how much money I got. I don't care how successful I've been. I don't care about anything else in this world. I want to hear that statement. Me too. From Jesus' lips. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. You've been called. We've been called by God to be ambassadors. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Yeah. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses. Mm -hmm. And it has, oh, God, I'll tell you what, if you don't highlight anything else, you should highlight that. Amen. Not imputing their trespasses. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory be to God. Amen. Amen. And has committed to us the word yeah. of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Mm -hmm. Thank you, God. As though God were pleading through us, we, ple we implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Think about this. You've been called with a holy, heavenly calling. You've been, the, the word of reconciliation has com been committed to you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's great that it was committed to the pastor. It's great that it was committed to Billy Graham. It's great that it was committed to the Apostle Paul. It's been committed to you. Yeah. This word of reconciliation. What is that word of reconciliation? This Bible? And it is this, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Yeah, right. You receive Amen. Christ, you receive the reconciliation yes, of right. Christ. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. They come together. The freedom that he, that he gives, the blessing that he gives. But see, I don't want to have this inside me and not know that I had opportunity to give it to others and I didn't do it. And that they stayed bound up in prison because I held my tongue. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. 
We are. We are a preservative of righteousness in the midst of a generation of corruption. Amen. We need to be the light that God's called us to be. Yes, amen. Amen. Yeah. Yes. Let me ask you a question. If you went to Target or Walmart and you said, you know what, I'm going to go get a new lamp. And you went out and you bought it and you found the one you wanted. Oh, that looks pretty, but beautiful, beautiful. <clears throat> Take it home, take it out, put the lampshade on it, plug it in, and go click, and it doesn't work. What do you do with it? No, you'd probably take it and put it in and use it as a doorstop, wouldn't you? <laughs> no, you'd bring it back and say, this thing doesn't work. This thing's no good. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Faith without works. That's right. That's right. Good work. Yeah. Hallelujah. We need to be about our Father's business. Yes. Amen. You have your Bibles, you have your electronic devices, turn over to Romans 10. Because I want you to see these. I want you to see these scriptures. You know, I've got a, a friend of mine who's a good young man. He's been through the university. He has a bachelor's and a master's. Both along the theological line. And I remember talking to him, and I just kind of, you know, I just, I like the word. You know me, I love the word. I preach the word. I speak the word a lot of times. And I just rattling scriptures off. And I, and I, because I was talking about the call of God that was on his life. <laughs> and I mentioned this scripture over in Romans 10. And later on, he sent me a text and asked me where that scripture was. That breaks my heart to know that I have someone who's gone through a theological school that didn't know where what I would consider a simple <coughs> scripture is. I know of someone who's been in the church for <coughs> decades and was recently asked about the story of uh, David and Bathsheba and they didn't know it. And I, I say that because ignorance of the word of God is very costly. Yeah. <laughs> John 8.31 that I've already quoted to you cannot be if you don't remain in the word. Yes. We've got to be students of the word. Don't listen to what I say. Verify what I say. Amen. Yeah. Listen to what I say. Trust but verify. If I can use Reagan's terms in dealing with the Soviet Union. Not that I consider myself a communist, a communist but I'm just simply saying. <laughs> trust but verify. I don't want you to trust. I don't want you to blindly trust what I say. I want you to go and find it for yourself. Because if you find it for yourself, it becomes your truth. And it's not my truth that you happen to hear. Romans 10, verse 11. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Wonderful word. Praise God. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. More good news. Just incredible stuff. Incredible. You don't need a preacher to go call on him on your behalf. That's right. That's right. You don't need an intercessor to get the blessing of the Lord. That's right. The same Lord is rich over all is rich to all who call upon him. It doesn't matter who you are. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And here's the crux here. Okay. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Mm -hmm. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? Mm -hmm. And how shall they hear without a preacher? Mm -hmm. And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful oh, are the yeah. feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, yes. who bring glad tidings of good things. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the world can't believe yes. 
in the one it has never heard of. Yeah. And it will never hear unless there's someone in front of them who's willing to preach it. That's right. That's right. And you don't have to worry about being sent because we've already established that. Mm -hmm. We've all been sent out into the world to preach yeah. the gospel. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. I heard the story told one time, and I, 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 I'm not didn't verify it, but I'm confident in the preacher who I heard it from. And he was talking about being free. And he referred to a group of soldiers who had been caught and were held as POWs in a Japanese prison camp. And much of the time while they were there, they were told lies about what was going on back home. Yeah. That the USA had yeah. fallen, yeah. that DC, Washington DC, had been invaded, and that their land was no more their land, and that they were prisoners of the Japanese and owned by them forever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And one day, they heard some big old planes <laughs> flying overhead. And they could see that they were not they Japanese. Were, yeah. They were American. That's right. yep. And as time went on, the GI broke in the door, mm. kicked in the door with his size 10 or 11 or 12 boots, whatever he had on. And the Japanese prisoner of war, this American, fell down at his boots, his ugly, nasty, old GI boots. Why? Because those boots represented freedom. Mm -hmm. And he was free. And all the lies that he had heard about what his life was going to be like fell by the wayside. And I can tell you this. When you take the word of reconciliation and you bring it to a prisoner's mm -hmm. cell, mm -hmm. which is many times their own life. Yes. And you preach the gospel yes. of truth yes. and the word of reconciliation, and you let them know they don't have to be in prison anymore. Yes. Amen. Mm -hmm. And that there's one who has called them and has set them free, and his name is Jesus. Mm -hmm. They will call your feet beautiful. Because yes. yeah. you brought the good news to yes. them. Yeah. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Glory to God. Yeah. Our job is to sow the word. Mm -hmm. Mark chapter 4, verses 3 and 14. It says, The sower sows the word. We must do what it is that God has called us to do. And we must be what it is that God has called us to be. He's called us to be light. He's called us to be salt. Salt does several things, a couple things. It preserves and it creates flavor. There's many a time, I know they tell me salt's not good for me, <laughs> but there's many times I get tired of eating bland food. And I reached for that salt shaker and I put it on. I had a bowl of corn yesterday. I love yeah. frozen corn. I just take frozen <laughs> corn, cook it up, put some butter on it, yeah. cover it with salt, and I'm just as <laughs> happy as a pig rolling yeah. in mud. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that salt makes a difference. Yeah. And we're called to be. We're called to be the salt of the earth. We're called to create a desire in someone yeah. to come Amen. towards oh, that. So you put salt on my food, I want to eat it now. That's right. mm -hmm. There's some foods I eat, I'm like, oh yeah, no, give me the salt shaker. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't even get, I get one bite, I'm like, this thing tastes like I am chewing cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> give me something to flavor it up. Yeah. Now my wife's cooking. Her cooking is always excellent. Yeah. Outstanding. Yeah. Actually, it is. Yeah. But... <laughs> We've got to be the salt, yes. and we've got to be the light. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. We've got to be what God calls us to be. Amen. Word of God tells us in Mark again, the kingdom of God as is, af is, is 
if a man should scatter seed on the ground. This is the way the kingdom of God expands. It doesn't expand if nobody knows about it. That's right. But if you deposit seed at your workplace, you deposit seed at your marketplace, you deposit seed at your gatherings that you connect with, you deposit seed as you're going down the road, somehow or other, you deposit seed in the ground. And what happens is, is the Bible tells us what? That one plants, another one waters, but who gives the increase? God. God. Right? Sometimes I've planted and planted and planted and I see nothing coming back. And other times I just drop, a, I just drop one little seed and man, I've had it happen. And people just cry and they just want God. I don't know what the difference is. I know it has to do with prayer and people that have planted before me. Yeah, yeah. But I know I'm responsible to plant. I'm responsible to water. End of discussion. God's responsible for the results. This word, and I, I, I want to bring it down to a close now, but this word should invade every area of our lives. Amen. The way we think, the way we speak, the way we deal with other people, the way we deal with our spouses, the way we deal with our children, the way we deal with our grandchildren, <laughs> the way we deal with our workplace, the way we deal as we drive down the road. As we drive down the road. Yeah. All of us. <laughs> All of us. And, and I'll tell you, let me just say this to you. I'm practicing, thank you Jesus, I'm practicing what I preach, but I'm practicing <laughs> doing much of what you'll see in this book. Amen. What I've been conditioning myself to think is I don't get offended on the road. You can't offend me on the road. Uh, is that a challenge? Now, yeah, it, 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 used to be, it used to be easy to do before. People cut me off now, and I, and I say that, that it, even if I want to get upset, I say that I'm, oh, I don't get offended. And I'll practice that. Even if it's a minor infliction, I say I don't get offended on the road. Amen. You know why? Because I'm reiterating that and I'm creating mental real estate in my brain. Amen. There you go. Yeah. That when the real temptation is there mm -hmm. for me to light it up, mm -hmm. I don't. Yeah. Because the first thing that's going to come out of my heart and my soul is I don't get offended on the road. Amen. I'm going to get upset about Because think about this. I get upset. My toxic stress level goes right through the roof. My brain runs for the next two or three or four hours because I'm so ticked at what so-and-so, who I don't even know and will probably never see again, just cut me off three hours ago, four hours ago. And I go through all of that stress when I could have simply said, I don't get offended. And drive on down the road and keep on singing praise songs. Amen. <laughs> Wherever it is, this word should invade every area of our lives. Amen. Wherever and whatever it is. And yes. if it does, it begins to affect everything and Amen. everyone, not only in our close inner circle, but all around us. Because guess what? If I don't get Pastor Les ticked off, he's not going to go home and get Obed ticked off. Because <laughs> when he goes home and gets Obed ticked off, she's going to go in the next day and she's going to get somebody ticked off in Providence City Hall. Yeah. And it goes on and on and on. Right? Because yeah, that's what happens. It's a ripple effect. Yeah. Unrighteousness is a has a ripple effect. So does righteousness. Yes. That's right. Amen. Amen. So does righteousness. Good word. I want to close with the last four sentences that are in your notes God is depending upon us the kingdom of God is depending upon us I believe it says the world is depending upon us we must be about our father's business Amen. Amen. You know, those uh, last four phrases are really, you know,